All right, we are live, Ivy, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am Ivy Felicia of MeMyBodyAndLove.com, and I'm here with Akila Richards of RadicalSelfie.com. And we're here today to talk about shame and self-expression. And um, they're both basically what, like polarizing opposites mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes. Um, but the, re the way that we got to this conversation was that I was reading an article on Medium um, that was written by your fat friend. So if you all ever go on Medium, you can check her out there. She has a lot of good articles. Um, and the title of the article was on tough love and your fat friend's health. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, um, I was reading it from the perspective of um, body acceptance, body peace, um, health at uh, every size. And as I began to read the article, I saw how self-expression really applied to the article. Um, and of course I had to share it with Akila, because she's radical selfie over here. <laughs> and I said, we need to talk about this. So that's how we arrived at really wanting to have this conversation and to record it so that we can share it with those of you who may be experiencing shame. Um, we really want to talk about what shame is, how we deal with shame, and how we actually release it and, and move to a liberation point in life. Yes, 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 exactly what Ivy said. Um, we saw such a correlation between those two things, like the idea of owning a body, you know, and what that ownership of body and self means, because of course our body is just one part of the self, but it's the most evident part. Um, it's the easiest part for people to judge. You know, you mm -hmm. can judge it without any other sort of exchange in terms of communication. Um, and it is also something that, other people, what you know, adults as we're children tend to feel a sense of ownership of. So mm -hmm. a parent or a caregiver of any type feels a sense of ownership over the entire person, including that person's body. And so from really early on, which of course is not a bad thing, right? Because there's protection and love and all of those things that are associated with um, someone feeling responsible for you in that way. But along with that comes um, other aspects of socialization, the caveats, if you will, that include things like um, someone else deciding what's okay for you, or uh, or maybe this is similar, someone else deciding what shouldn't be okay for you. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the easiest ones that I see is, you know, as we talk about all the time, Ivy, um, the idea of someone being fat, you know, mm -hmm. or what or whatever that whatever that means for someone, because of course. It you know that's going to vary whether it's with five pounds over what somebody thinks or three hundred pounds over what someone thinks, but there's this idea that um, if you're fat or if you're skinny, but especially for someone who is considered fat, that you shouldn't be okay with that, and that because I believe you shouldn't be okay with that, I am well within my right, maybe even a social service sort of right, to judge the person to speak mm. about that judgment and to push that person towards what I think is right. Yeah. What from childhood all the way on up. Right. Yes. So yeah, which is why it becomes so difficult for us to navigate because it's ingrained from so early on that sometimes I, I think there's a sense of confusion and of course weight is just one aspect, um, yes. but there's confusion like, well, well, maybe this is good for me. Maybe I shouldn't have this many tattoos or maybe I should perm my hair or maybe I should try to look taller or maybe I should try to make my breasts look smaller or you know, all, all of these different aspects of self that are very much rooted in someone else's opinion about mm -hmm. who we are, how we should show up and how we should feel. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yes. And the and the thing is that it starts out with as as you said at the beginning, it starts out with other people feeling like they have a right to comment on the outward part of you because you know, we're mind, body, and soul. We're 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 different parts. But like you said, people see the body, so they feel like they have the right to comment on your body or to somewhat in some way regulate your body, which that's a whole nother conversation about regulating people's bodies. Um, 
<laughs> and then that can become internalized, you know, especially if you start as a child and you get older. And if someone's always telling you about how the outward part of you is not enough or too much or whatever, then you internalize that to mean that about who you are as a person yes. and your soul and your being. And so I think like that's where we we align and say, okay, you know, whatever the topic is, whether it's um, weight, skin, race, gender, hair, um, profession, if someone is always commenting on who you are and how you express yourself, if you internalize that to mean that you have to in some way mute yourself or change yourself or transform yourself, um, then you never really know who you are. You're just always trying to be accepted. Yes, absolutely. And so that's that's essentially what this dialogue is about. You know, Ivy and I wanted to, um, as I like to say, explore and express this space because we wanted to talk about it, one, to just kind of give it a voice from our particular perspectives. Um, and then also to create a space where the healing can happen for this, the facing yeah. it and the healing it, because we're about there's one thing to to point out the things that are wrong and, and i think that's a damn good thing i have no problem with that we need to do that so that people don't feel alone um in their pain and so that people can start to name their pain which is such a radical step towards healing when we can do that but we also want to talk about some of the solutions because this isn't just yeah. about standing in the pain it's about moving towards how you want to feel um and so i'd like to start off by just reading an excerpt from the think piece by your fat friend and she's on medium and we'll put the link here um, in the show notes or in the uh, broadcast notes later um, so you can take a look at that but there's a specific section that just really really resonated with me and i'll pull that up really quickly so she says man i could just read this whole thing <laughs> um but essentially you know she's talking about how um, she went to the doctor's office and the doctor was just saying, you know, I know that pizza tastes good and I know that ice cream tastes good, but it makes your body big and fat. Um, you know, just basically deciding what her lifestyle was like without really any knowledge and, um, and basically be putting her in a position to feel like something was wrong with her um, mm -hmm. and that she needed to do something about it. And so um, one of the things that I really, really appreciated, I appreciated the, the candor in the total um, piece, but there was a part where she said it was about her her body apology, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find that exact thing. Um, let's see. So she, she had this apology that said, and I'll read a little bit before, shame diseased all of my conversations like blight spreading through a crop. I constantly inoculated those around me with an endless string of caveats and excuses for daring to be seen when I wasn't yet thin. And we could replace thin with so many other things, right? Mm -hmm. Still, I received unsolicited health suggestions, stern lectures, gym recommendations, names of surgeons, an avalanche of advice I was already taking. Talking about diet and exercise, my favorite vegetables and personal bests were all shorthand to preempt the inevitable. I know I'm fat, but I'm spending every waking moment to change that. I hope you don't write me off completely. <laughs> so that for me, you know, a level of resonance with, I think so many of us can relate to that. Um, one of the things my family does is that we unschool, right? Which is basically a curiosity led style of um, learning and parenting um, that is really in partnership with a child instead of deciding in advance that this is a, the curriculum that a child should follow. And there's so many opportunities in this space for, um, for me to get really present with how I'm showing up and the pressure to lean towards how other people need me to show up as a parent you know mm -hmm. because it's like this idea that okay if you're going to pull your child out of the school system i don't understand that so you need to validate them for me so i know you're doing something but i don't get it and i need you to explain it to me so that i get it so that i don't write you off right mm -hmm. that's a different version of that same apology um so many spaces where that comes up so it becomes a matter of 
validation, like trying to feel valid in your pursuits and having other people feel it, as she was saying here in this think piece, oh, it's not that I'm not doing anything about it. I know, you know, this preemptive way that you walk into a space. And when you talk about preemptive, that's affecting your mindset. That's affecting mm -hmm. how you feel when you walk out the door or when you post something on social media or when you're having a conversation with anybody. You know, there's so much lost in communication because you're so busy trying to be what that other person is okay with. And then we right. suffer. we suffer because of that. Right. As soon as you said that, it just resonated because I was thinking the same thing. It's about what people want you to be in order so that you can feel good about yourself. So it's this mindset of I need them to be OK with me so I can be OK with me. So you're constantly shifting or changing or like she said, I'm spending every waking moment trying to change that. You know, and so you're you're constantly changing yourself because you just want other people to accept you so that you can accept you. And you're yes. in a position of almost, um, as I call it, you know, turmoil or war with whatever it is, whether it be um, your body as in weight or shape or uh, gender or color or heights or sh or the your skin tone, um, whatever it be, you're constantly in war with that very thing about you because you feel like if I can just change this, then people will mm -hmm. accept me. Um, and then I can be in p at peace. Yes. You know? <laughs> so these other people are like holding your, you're allowing them to hold your peace in their hand. Um, and the crazy thing is that it's constantly shifting because there's, all these different people with all these different messages about what it, what you should be. Um, and you never really can attain that piece because you're looking outwardly for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I love that you said that. And I, I want to talk a little bit about body peace mm -hmm. because in that we'll, we'll also address some of the pain points. And so um, I really would like a solution oriented and not in a sense to solve all of the ills of body policing and mutedness and self-expression, but just to start pointing um, ourselves in a direction, because one of the things I know, firstly, when Ivy said, you know, we're allowing them to do that, or you're allowing them to do that, we get why. So this is not a judgment on the fact that you're allowing this to happen. We've all done and probably are doing that in some way. So this isn't, but why we're saying you're allowing is because you also have the opportunity to disallow. There are ways mm -hmm. that you can really start reclaiming that self and really start operating from a, a sense of peace, being at peace with your own body. And before we get into that, um, I know that one of the things that I, I that really connects with me and that I use in my own work personally and professionally is um, like this idea of reclaiming, you know, myself of of going in and looking at all of the places where I don't. I don't feel like I get to be my my truest self and um, and finding ways to, to really address that. And so one of the ways that Ivy does that in particular is through this work with body peace, right? Mm -hmm. So Ivy, can you talk to us a little bit about what that means? Because I know when we say things like going within or listening inward, which is a big one for me, I had to realize that for everyone going inward or listening inward isn't always the healthiest space because yeah. those messages are internalized. So for the person who's watching this and saying, yeah, okay, so I'm allowing them to do those things. And I, but I don't know inside of me feels the same way as that external environment. What have you found professionally and maybe even personally that you can use to start working towards a, a, a place of peace with your body? Um, well, what I really found is that it starts with learning what you want, right? Because like we've been talking about this whole time, there's so many external messages. And a lot of times we don't know the difference between what we've been taught and what other people have told us for so long and what we really believe in, what we really want. And it really starts there. And, and sometimes you kind of sit in that stage for a while, right? I'm, I'm sure you've been there, Akilah. Yeah. We've talked about that. <laughs> you know, it yeah. doesn't just, you don't just say, okay, well, this is what I want and write it down. You know, so you really have to sit with it for a while. And it's like, okay, um, in referencing your body, you may say, well, okay, do I like my body? 
body? You know, do I like my hips? Do I like my size? Do I like my skin tone? I don't know. You know, because you don't know if it's external messages. You don't know if it's something that you believe. You just know that you've been in this zone of not liking it. And you yep. don't know where that not liking it came from. Yep. So it really starts with learning your own voice, learning what you um, what you truly believe, um, and learning that intuitive voice, which simply means, you know, when we talk about the conscious, when we talk about what we feel in our heart, what we feel in our soul. And sometimes we've been so disconnected from that for so long that, again, that takes a process. It's about just being patient with yourself. And sometimes it's taking one thing at a time. You know, when so, so, something as simple as putting on an outfit and somebody says, oh, I don't like that. That That's not flattering on you. Or that mm -hmm. doesn't look good on you. But you know, when you got it, you were like, oh, I like this. And you you, know, you go out, yeah. you come out of the room and you show whoever. And they're like, what? You know, and that's a perfect opportunity in that moment to decide, okay, is this about them? Or is this about how I feel about it? And to go with your heart and your voice, you know, yeah. Like she was saying in this article, choosing your food, you know, are you choosing your food because this is what the article says and this is what your auntie says and your girlfriend says and you shouldn't be eating this or you should be eating that or have you really learned what works for your body and what doesn't work for your body and what your body likes and what it doesn't. So, yes, yeah. you know, and to answer your question, it really starts with learning you yeah. and, and what's in your heart. Yeah. And I, I'm glad that you said learning and not knowing because there's a, mm -hmm. there's a big difference. I think there's a lot of pressure that comes with the need to know, and we won't mm -hmm. always know. Mm -hmm. uh, we can always, you know, we feelings, I always say feelings are fevers, right? And a fever is really mm -hmm. an indication of something else that's happening because feelings are going to vary from day to day, from mm -hmm. moment to moment, from whatever's happening with your body, whoever's talking to you. So that's one of the easiest ways that I've found, um, to, to really start to learn yourself is to pay attention to your feelings. Yes. Cause it, especially yes. if you're not, you know, we're very fortunate to be in an environment where we have people like each other. We have a circle where mm -hmm. we talk about these beautiful things that are, um, very much about mindsets and belief and intuition and self-trust and self-inquiry. Mm -hmm. But um, if you're not in that space, you need to be on our email list because then you can get in that space, first of all. Right. Um, and then secondly, what you can start to do um, to practice in between our email messages <laughs> is exactly what Ivy said, giving yourself opportunities to pay attention to and honor your feelings. So mm -hmm. even simple things like if you're going to meet up with a couple of friends, right? pay attention to how you're feeling. Like, don't just go through the motions. Think about what you're going to put on if you're mm -hmm. going to um, hang out with them. Do you feel the need to like wear makeup where as you normally don't? Mm -hmm. and, if, and as you're having that feeling, so it's not about judging yourself. It really is about like observation. So you mm -hmm. say, well, why do I feel yes. like doing that? Oh, because Ivy always be like, why are your eyebrows look like that? You know, like, mm -hmm. and then you pay attention to that. And then you pay attention to how those things make you feel. I would mm -hmm. even journal. You can have feelings journals. And I know um, our friend Monique, <laughs> Clarity Coach, would agree with that very much. Journaling is such a powerful tool. But really just start to pay attention to And if you want to record them in a journal or on your phone, that's fine. Or if you just want to have a, a continued awareness of it and not, not necessarily record it, that's fine too. Do whatever mm -hmm. works for you. But what's great about recording it is that you're able to sort of look at the data, um, you know, over a period of time. So you say, if I'm going to hang out, if I'm hanging out with with Ivy and Monique, like, I don't know, twice a month, which would be awesome, but we're in different places. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to hang out with them twice a month, but whenever I'm getting ready to go, I, I notice that. I'm different. I noticed that there's a bit of turmoil. I noticed that it will take me like 40 minutes to figure out what to wear. Mm -hmm. Whereas normally I'm just like, this is cute and it's clean and I feel good and I put it on. That's an opportunity for you to mind those emotions, for you to mind those feelings and say, what is it about this environment? Is it something that they're saying? Is it a belief that I have that isn't even connected to something they said? So then that way you can really start to analyze and understand how your external environment is influencing your feelings. And that yes. the more you do that, 
then you can get really clear on what's happening. And then you can start to really just test out different ways to feel how you want to feel. So maybe, yes. you, yeah, so maybe you wear the thing that you weren't gonna wear with them normally. And then you see if they say something, if your eyebrows, you didn't get your eyebrows done before you met up with them, did they say something? And whatever yeah. they said, how did you feel about that? Even if you agreed, even if you felt like it was time to do your eyebrows, or maybe mm -hmm. you feel like you don't wanna do your eyebrows at all because they remind you of your father's eyebrows and that's a beautiful thing. Then you can start shifting that way by not getting your eyebrows done. You yeah. know, just the small, and that seems probably like such a uh, a minor thing, but I wanted to use a very general, um, easily accessible example because, of course, that plays into much larger things too, like what we choose to do with our bodies. You know, major issues like um, reproductive rights and justice. Yeah. You know, um, b politics, respectability politics when it comes to how we dress, or these stupid ass rules about. Who, what you shouldn't wear after a certain age, like how to dress after 40 or 50 or whatever the hell. All of these <laughs> things, <laughs> all of these things, minor and major, influence the environment, which in turn is gonna influence how we're showing up in the world. So that's how you start to listen inward past the noise to the yeah. feelings and through to how you wanna feel. Yes, absolutely. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just amening it all. And, yeah. you know, even just hearing you talk about it gives me all the feels because um, and when I say all the feels, it means like I feel really good sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it means I feel bad too, but yep. either way, um, I honor my feelings and I, and that's just awesome to be able to be in that space. And again, it's not something that happens overnight. Right. Um, and it is a part of releasing the shame around your feelings too, because we've been taught to only value happy feelings and, you know, excited feelings. But if you feel angry or if you feel sad, mm -hmm. you know, or if you feel confused, then that's something that you should feel shame around. It's like, oh, I shouldn't be sad. I got to get out it, of this sadness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I can't be like that. I can't be um, nervous or, or feel confused or, you know, there's something wrong with that. I have to get out of that space. But it's like when you can... I, I love how you um, focus in on feelings because it's like if you can start with honoring your feelings, I think you can go into a space of honoring anything else about you because it, it really starts there. And yeah. one of the things when you were talking about, um, you know, just listening in for how different environments affect you. And I'll just share personally that, you know, I have been I've shared online, I've shared publicly that I've gone back and forth with, you know, chronic illness. And I was away from consistent fitness for a while because my body was just not feeling it mm -hmm. <laughs> and was just not cooperating. And so recently when it came time for me to go back into the gym, it was like this big daunting thing of, okay, if I go to the gym, I've got to be in there for an hour. I have to run two miles. I have to lift this, you know, everyone around me. And it really was a thing of saying, okay, where are those messages coming from? Mm -hmm. And realizing that they were coming from external sources. My body wasn't ready to go in there and be running two, three, four, five miles right off the bat after having, you know, been sick for a while. So I had to really say, okay, what feels good for me? Okay. Yeah. Going in there the first day, <laughs> you know, it's just to get through the door and just to get be in there and to be present and to do what works for me. And to not worry about what, you know, because when you go in there, everyone's saying, oh, good, great. You'll lose weight soon enough, you know, or if you tell friends and family, they're looking at you like, I thought you were going to the gym. You don't look like you're losing weight because other people will put their expectations on you. Yes. But you have to shed all that and say, okay, what am, what am I doing? What am I here for? And why am I here? Yeah. And that that's just like a real true to life example of something that, you know, maybe if you're trying to think of, OK, where do I start at? How do I work through listening to my own voice? It's just tuning out other people in, in every situation that comes up. It happens all the time, every day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also allowing yourself to be human with it. Right. Because even within mm -hmm. our own feelings, there is there's. Um, 
like separate, there are different things that are happening. Sometimes the feelings are conflicting. Sometimes we mm -hmm. feel like, well, okay, I do want to be able to run two miles, but I really don't like mm -hmm. running. So how do yeah. I, you know, being okay with all of that, because all mm -hmm. of you is fine wherever you are in your journey. Mm -hmm. And so, the, mm -hmm. so as we talk about this, and this is so important, because one of the things Ivy wanted to make sure that we were discussing here is to um, be able to identify shame. Yeah. Right. And oftentimes guilt and shame are they feel like they're linked or mm -hmm. and we're not able to confuse the two because, you know, guilt, if I say, OK, I'm going to exercise four times this week mm -hmm. and then I don't, then maybe I experience a feeling of guilt. But if I'm experiencing mm -hmm. shame because I'm not doing, as Ivy said, two, three, four miles in a run and blah, 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 then I need to reconnect with myself and say, wait a minute, as Ivy said, examining where that shame is coming from, okay. where those feelings, even if you can't mm -hmm. name it, where that feeling, that yucky feeling, the one that makes you not want to go to the gym, not because your body isn't ready, but something else doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. Recognizing that and being okay with feeling guilt, shame, all of the feelings that you feel, but then also realizing that you're entitled to other feelings as well when mm -hmm. you are ready. So that may mean that you don't go to the gym, not because, and maybe that's because you want to avoid the people. Instead, maybe you do a workout at home, at right? Home, right. Um, mm -hmm. or, or whatever that thing is, or maybe you skip that day because you just it just doesn't feel good. Or you mm -hmm. go in and you decide to focus on something like yoga that has nothing to do with, you can't take the selfie and be like, oh, burn 10 million calories, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and, be, and being completely okay with that too. I, yeah. so, so that's how you do the work. So it isn't just about naming the feelings. It isn't uh, just mm -hmm. about being able to always tune other people out because that's not always feasible for us wherever we are in our journey. Um, you know, we might not be as strong as Ivy to be able to do that um, or we're not there in the journey yet. Maybe our strength lies instead in being able to, to listen inward and to, as Ivy said, honor that feeling. So mm -hmm. if you don't feel like somebody patting you on the back for being in the gym when they didn't pat the other person on the back and you know what that's actually about, then again, maybe you don't have to go. Maybe you can find a different way mm -hmm. to feed that need that you had um, mm -hmm. to exercise or to, you know, to connect with your body through movement, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like for you. So, so those are some of the ways that you start to identify the shame, mm -hmm. which is such an important part of um, getting to the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And it really is about authenticity, you know, about just recognizing, which just means being true to yourself and about what, when we're talking about the feelings, what you really feel and what you really want and yeah. not feeling like you have to um, adopt what other people are telling you, you should feel the shoulds. Like, I, you know, my thing is I say, I don't let people should me anymore, you know, yeah. because it's like, oh, you should feel this way or you should feel that way or you should be happy. I mean, even that emotion, there's times when people say, you know, oh, you got this or you have that or you accomplished that, you should be happy. But if you're not feeling it in that moment, then you're not. Right. A perfect opportunity to ask the why and like Akila said to journal about what well, everybody says you know I graduated I should be feeling happy but I don't you know maybe you feel fearful because okay it's a new stage of life and I don't know where I'm going from here or you know it's not always about a negative feeling sometimes people will should you and make you think that you should have a positive feeling around something right. that you don't right but it's always being true to you and to your own voice, your own inner voice and your own soul and your own heart in every situation. And I think that that's how we begin to release shame because shame means that we're taking on what other people say about us and we're, we're internalizing that, you know, and we're allowing that to affect what we do, what, what our choices are, what our behaviors are. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in a society, again, where this policing of of the self, you know, both the physical body and the subtle body, it, basically meaning how you should think and how you should feel. People feel so much within their rights because we have so much access to each other now with all of these technological mm -hmm. tools. We feel within our right um, to be able to do that. So that's the other part of it, too. Check yourself to see where you're doing the policing. You know, I write and speak so openly about how my um, friendships and some of my professional relationships as a coach and as a writer 
have really helped me to grow because I absolutely was in a space of, I was socialized to believe that, you know, if you were fat, then it was your fault and it was a problem, not your problem, a problem, because somehow the whole world was negatively impacted by however you were showing up in your body. Um, especially being from the Caribbean where a big part of it um, is like, is this weird fine line between somebody being like thick and plump and then fat, mm -hmm. you know, it's like mm -hmm. all these weird variations or even in, in um, music, you know, I know I hear it a lot in dance hall culture, which I'm not knocking dance hall culture, um, but it's a, a type of reggae music, if, if you're not familiar, where, you know, it's this idea that a woman in particular, her body should be perfect. There's no marks on our belly and there's no this and that. And she's like, perfect. And so even hearing that as a child growing up, it, there are some things that I did quite naturally as a result of that thing. It, I thought that it was my belief, but in really acknowledging mm -hmm. it and exploring it and talking with other people who are doing this work. I'm like, yo, the minute I remember telling an old friend of mine that I realized some years ago that it was habit, like automatic autopilot, that when I walk through a door, I would pull my stomach in. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like when you're taking a picture and they say, you know, pull yeah. your stomach in. That was like <laughs> automatic for me. And I, it probably started from when I was a girl. I, I don't know. Yeah. But, but even, and then when she said, you know, I said that and she was like, why? And I'm like, what do you mean? Why? Why would I just be having my stomach poking out? You know, and I was, I mean, I was probably like in my twenties when this happened. It wasn't like that mm -hmm. long ago. I'm 38 now. Um, so those are some of the things that you realize. So what are you doing? that has something to do with someone else's perception of you. So that yes. was one thing for me. And then I stopped doing that um, because it felt oppressive. It felt like something I was doing to present myself as opposed mm -hmm. to being present. Um, and so what are some of the things, you know, presenting versus being present is something that tends to resonate with people a lot. So, so that's another place that you can start. Where do you feel like a presentation version of yourself? Yeah. What are the environments where you feel like you need to be a certain way? And some of the easy ones are like at work because I have to dress yeah. this way or whatever. Cool. Maybe that one doesn't feel like something that's within your control at the moment. What does feel like it's within your control? Start there. Be aggressive with that shit. Like really go in, maybe even making a list and then saying, OK, these are the things that are going on and this is how I feel. But how do I want to feel? And what are some yeah. of the things that I can do to or some of the things I can read or some of the people that I can connect with because sometimes again you sometimes it's not it's not in you you're not able to access it I should say because it's always in there but sometimes other people can give like a little nudge a little vibration that can really bring you into that space so that's kind of how you support yourself once you identify that shame to start to recognize it and then slowly slowly on your own time and in your own way shift yourself out of that Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think that goes into the space of you asked me about like, where, how do we find body peace? And that's also part of the process of getting into a space of being at peace with your body. Because it's like when you can identify, okay, how do I want to feel? in my body like you're saying how do how do i want to feel and what are the things that matter to me the most then you can pursue those things and put them in a hierarchy of what's most important and then just focus on those things in that moment and that's one of the things that i say um when i talk about me my body and love is that i work to, i support people in finding um body peace and self-love at any stage of life because yes you're constantly the body is constantly changing yeah. like i say all the time from the time you came out of the womb to right in this moment your body has never been the same it's always growing or shrinking or wrinkling or whatever you know it's yeah. always changing and so it is possible to say okay today in this moment how do i be at peace with who i am and what my body is or what it looks like yes um yes because we don't know what tomorrow is going to be and whether it's something you know a lot of times we talk about we tend to talk about like weight and those things but there are people who um you know find out that they have terminal illnesses there are people who go out and have car accidents and lose limbs or lose limbs from from illnesses and their body is completely different they woke up one day it was one way 
and it's a totally different way the next day and it's like okay how do i be at peace with this i was okay with that body but now i have this body how do i be at peace so um that's goes back mm -hmm. to saying okay how do i want to feel yes you know even though my body changed maybe i gained weight or you know, I lost a limb or I'm not as fast as I used to be, or I lost my hair or my skin or whatever is going on today. This is what I want to feel like. This is how I want to feel. I want to be at peace. I want to be, I want to feel love for my body, no matter what's going on. And then just work towards that goal. Yes, absolutely. I love that. And, and shifting your normal, because for a lot of us, it, it feels, um, I know I hear it all the time, especially as a mother of two girls, where people will just project those those ideas. Oh, you know, right, you better do this while you're young and your body looks great. Or, you know, and I, I'm so protective of those messages. And I do that by making it a point to say in that space, in front of that person, instead of addressing the person, I talk to my daughter, whichever mm -hmm. one of them, about what the person is saying. I remember we were, um, we did a boot camp at the park, this impromptu boot camp thing at the park. You know how I feel about boot camps i don't like them <laughs> but the guy was really nice and he was starting out and so we did the boot camp and after the camp there were two women there and i remember them uh, pushing the girls to the front and being like oh they you're young and oh, i look so messy and blah blah and your stomach's still flat and da, da, da. and you know and they were in their mind's eye I totally understand that these were compliments that they were giving yeah. the girls, but there it is again, that socialization. So I said to the girls, no, nope, back up, let them come in front or you stand actually wherever you want to stand. And I'm going to stand right here because how I look right now and how you all look right now and how they look right now is completely okay. It's like yeah. we normalize body judgment, both, you know, our own judgment of our bodies and our judgment of other people's bodies and other people's judgment of our bodies. We normalize that as if to say, you know, well, it's natural to want to look and feel young and vibrant. It isn't. What's natural okay. is to want to be healthy. And that mm -hmm. is, that is going to vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. And it is each person's business. Like that's mm -hmm. the thing that helped me as a former body judger. Um, mm -hmm. One of the main things that helped me to shift that is like, wait a minute, this is none of my business. Mm -hmm. Truly, this is the, I am not helping someone by saying, you know, you ashy or, you know, mm -hmm. you need to gain weight or, you know what, I, this is not helpful. Even if the person themselves said that they wanted to do it, mm -hmm. because unless they are specifically asking you what yes. they should do, that's the barometer right there. That's the easy gauge. If you're about to say something or write something or do something, did this person ask me what they should do about their body or their whatever? Real easy. Yes. This is a close ended question. Yes or no. Like yes. right now, even if they asked me a month ago, did they ask me right now? Mm -hmm. If they didn't shut up, like mm -hmm. do put it somewhere else truly. So, and I tell my daughters that all, all the time, Hey, there are other places where you can express whatever that feeling is, but giving your perspective to that person without their consent is a form of bullying. And yeah. I just think it's also horrible karma and it lends to a society of hurt people who end up finding other ways to hurt other people instead of dealing with their pain. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And that's powerful because a lot of times we, we understand that you wouldn't go up to a stranger and like, well, some people would, but <laughs> most people wouldn't go up to a stranger and just touch them in a private place or something like that. But they have no problem using words in that way. You know, right. you'll, you'll walk up to a stranger and just say something, you know, one of the things that I really learned in doing this work and that um, I really became enlightened around is, you know, women who are pregnant. You know, like people just feel like they can go up and touch their, their stomachs, you know, just out of the, because they're pregnant. It's like, oh, let me rub your belly, you know, but, or, you know, will comment, oh, look at you, you're getting big. And, you know, that's not a compliment to every, everybody, you right. know, even with men, I've had men who, you know, when we have body image conversations, they'll say that, you know, people will say to them, hey, what's up, big guy, you know, or whatever, because they're larger men or, you know, people feel like it's okay to just say that and assume that if you're a guy that you feel good about that, but that it actually makes them feel, un un um, I'm sorry, uncomfortable yeah. to hear that comment. So you can't assume that what you think 
you know, oh, you lost weight. Oh, you're getting skinnier. You think because you want to lose weight or you want to get skinnier that it feels good for you, but you don't know what's happening in that person's life. You don't know if they have a terminal illness. You don't know why they lost the weight. You don't know if they're struggling with an eating disorder. Um, you know, whatever it is, Sometimes we feel so comfortable using our words to reach out to people yeah. and just, you know, violate that private space. And when you said that, that's what I heard is that you're violating someone's private space with your words and your comments. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's bullying and getting in their business, too, because it's yeah. not your business. And as I tell my girls, every part is a private part if you didn't get my mm -hmm. consent to touch it. So it doesn't matter if it's a protruding belly or if it's just my shoulder. Mm -hmm. If there isn't yes. an established relationship that it's OK to touch me, you just touch mm -hmm. the private part. So like, yes. you know, listen Good to this. Point. Yeah. So, so even things like that, because what you consider private might be different than what I consider private. And the point is that each of us get to decide. And, um, and, uh, and I want to, I feel like it's important to say, if you feel like, if we talk about these sort of like micro aggressions and some of them are not so micro and you feel like, ah, it feels like semantics. So what if I'm saying big guy, if this is a big guy or whatever, I, frankly, I'm not really talking to you. If, if you mm -hmm. feel like this is not something personally, because I don't want to speak for Ivy, I if you feel like it is um, like people, because I hear this a lot and I see these comments a lot, I, I write a lot online um, for various sites and some of the comments, oftentimes people say things like, God, you know, people, are, how am I supposed to tell if somebody is sensitive or, you know, mm -hmm. this about, really, you can't say that somebody's thick or I can't say that somebody's slim, what's wrong with this, what's wrong with that? If you feel, or I should say, if, if you are experiencing the need consistently to defend that, then you probably got to check yourself. Because if, yeah. it, if that keeps on coming up, it ain't the rest of the world, honey. You know, there, yeah. there is an opportunity there. And this isn't a judgment on you, but it's an opportunity to look at it and say, okay, so is this okay for me? Am I, because maybe you are okay with it. Maybe you, maybe you do feel like the world is too sensitive and people should get over being called something outside of what they're comfortable with. Cool. We, we couldn't hang out, but okay. Um, if that's how you feel. But I also want you to, 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 to question it. I believe in questioning things. That's how I get to a lot of spaces that make sense for my soul. Questioning myself, questioning what I, what I believe, questioning whether if my belief conflicts with someone else's or some uh, a level of someone's comfort, am I okay with that? Because if mm -hmm. I did feel like, well, she does need to lose weight. Okay, if I feel like that and my expression of that, whether it's through words or actions or whatever, am I okay with how that makes her feel? And which mm -hmm. thing is the priority? Me expressing my um, opinion to her or her opinion on herself that is influenced by me? which one is more important and then challenge yourself to act from the space of whichever one is more important to you. And that's a part yeah. of how we help heal um, aspects of shame and self-expression that are rooted in um, these kind of like jabs at people that we may or may not realize that we're taking, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome um, perspective to help people who might be having that type of reaction and are watching. Um, I do want to ask, like, how, what do we tell people? I want to make sure that we tell people who do go out because a lot of times it's easy to, think, you know, go out, do what you want to do, be who you are, feel the way you want to feel, wear what you want to wear, exist in the world in your body. <laughs> um, but when we go out, there are going to be people like the ones that you just addressed who will have things to say, um, who will have words and comments, who will, you know, give you resistance around wanting to be yourself and wanting to be authentic. So how can we support those people who are just starting out and tiptoeing into authenticity or just starting to um, tap into their authentic selves? How can we give them some supportive information to help them be prepared for those reactions that are <laughs> going to come? <laughs> yeah, so, so the first thing is um, to, to me is to not, not need yourself to feel prepared because it, you know, again, depending on where you are that day, that moment, that, that 
chemical moment, you know, again, whatever is going on with your body, mind, you you may react differently, and that's okay because if they opened up to to give you something, then they're also opening themselves up to receive something. But in terms of going at it from a space of um a non-reactive space, I guess a more proactive space, I think it goes back to some of the things that we've discussed earlier in this talk, Ivy. The first thing is to start to practice, and it is a practice. I think a lifelong practice of um self-inquiry you know conversations with self mindfulness you know these terms that can seem so like cliche but really are powerful powerful tools to um self-expression and body peace authentic self-expression and body peace so one of the things we just mentioned is um paying attention to how you feel when you're about to go into an environment right mm -hmm. any environment and then doing what you can in that moment to honor how you want to feel. So if you love turquoise, but your aunt keeps saying that, no, honey, because you're that size, you can't do turquoise, you have to do black, mm -hmm. put on the turquoise that day. Mm -hmm. That's a simple thing. Maybe you put a black blazer over the turquoise, that's your comfy, comfy blanket, right? Your safety mm -hmm. blanket, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. There, There is no one right methodology for feeling comfortable in your skin and how you express yourself. Test different things out. Be around different people. That's a really powerful one to me. And it doesn't have to be like physically around them. Listening to podcasts, um, signing up for newsletters. I, those are things that empowered me so much as I shifted my mindset from who I wasn't and who I needed to become over to who I actually was becoming and who I wanted to be. I surrounded myself virtually at first um, and then tangibly when I could with people who made me feel as the saying goes, okay to love, right? Like and what, whatever that love means. So any spaces where you, you don't feel um, accepted see what you can do to start to shift out of those spaces because you may not change those people's minds and it is yeah. their prerogative to feel how they feel you are in charge of self and so you know personal leadership what what does that mean how can you lead yourself and i always use the example like over and over of the inner little girl you know i think about my seven eight nine year old self and be like if she was around these people and she felt like this and it didn't feel good and she told me that what would i do Oh, I would mm -hmm. say don't hang around those people because you don't have to. Or if it's somebody yeah. at work or maybe it's a parent, you know, it's someone in the home, then starting to practice self-expression, not just taking it in and nodding your head, but saying, mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. And I actually don't want to have this conversation with you. You're yeah. not, if that's not your way, shifting over to something else. Like there, there's no, there, there's no aspect of passivity, right? That's going to solve the thing. There does need to be action and that action yeah. is going to look like different things for different people so explore the things that you can do which again is about the people you're around the resources that you're taking in consistently and then your willingness and ability to express things that are contrary to what that that bully you know whoever that person is that's choosing to bully in that moment whatever they're saying or doing those those are the things that i would say so human resources digital resources um you know or or tangible in terms of books or whatever those things are and then practicing slowly surely steadily um what i call radical self-expression which, which is my right to explore and express my feelings in a moment from a space of confidence you know yeah that's yeah. good that's really good perspective and i definitely agree that it can show up for it will show up for different people in different ways and sometimes it will show up for you differently on different days yes like i know that i've had people comment on things sometimes it's my uh cho cho choosing to be an entrepreneur yep. sometimes it's my lifestyle choices <laughs> mm -hmm. my marital status uh my hair my body you know people just say what they want to say and sometimes for me it means saying something sometimes for me it means just walking away and not because i'm being passive 
as for me, some moments when I walk away, it's because I'm choosing not to invest energy exactly. in that conversation. Exactly. And I know that that person, no matter, I can talk for 10 hours and open up a complete dissertation <laughs> and they're still not going to get it or they're not going to change their mind. And it's just going to frustrate me, drain me. So I just walk away. Yes. But then there's sometimes where, um, I had a situation where someone said something and normally I walk away from that person. But in that moment, I said, that's really inappropriate. Yep. And they just said, okay. And they repeated it. And I said, no, that's inappropriate. And I don't like it. And then for me, it was, it had nothing to do with that person. It had everything to do with Ivy yep. because I knew that if I walked away and what they said, if I didn't speak up for myself, that I was going to internalize that toxic message and maybe you know it was going to be something that was going to affect me later so i needed to use my voice to speak up for myself in that moment yeah. so it's never going to be the same and sometimes you I, I don't think there's a right or a wrong i don't want to say sometimes you get it right sometimes you don't but sometimes you express a certain way and sometimes you don't it's never going to be the same it goes back to like you said akila knowing how you want to feel yep knowing what what um, you value what's most important to you in that moment and just going with it. Yeah. And then whatever you feel afterwards, honoring those feelings too. Yeah. It's a practice. <laughs> it's a practice. Yeah. As we both say it's a practice and it could be a very beautiful one. And so we absolutely um, invite you if this resonates with you in any way, any aspects of it. And again, we'll put the links in there to that wonderful thought piece that just kind of got us um, inspired and in this space. <laughs> And then we'll also link you to, to us and some of the people in our circle who are really, really supportive of what it means to develop a relationship of peace and love and acceptance for um, your whole body, physical body, subtle body, all of those things. So we'll absolutely leave you with those resources. And we also encourage you to share your own resources either with us yeah. or with the people in your circle, because again, we've normalized these sorts of pain. And um, just as they became normal as a result of people just constantly pushing those messages, I absolutely believe that we can normalize body peace and we can yes. normalize authentic self-expression that is not rooted in hurting other people. Um, you know, or making our opinion more right than someone else's. I, I believe that. And if that's something that you believe or even hope for, then um, over at Ivy's website, which again is, Ivy, tell us again. <laughs> it's me, my body and love.com. Yes. Me, my body and love.com or over at radical selfie.com. Those are some of the spaces where you absolutely are welcome to come through and engage as much or as little as you would like. And just um, drinking all of these resources because we're all the way here for complete acceptance and love around your entire self, physical, subtle, and everything else. All right. Yeah. So we yeah. appreciate you so much for being here. Did you have any last words that you wanted to share, Ivy? I feel good and done. I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel good. I, I want to thank you for this. And I just want to say, I think you mentioned earlier that um, when you go on our websites and you tap into us, make sure you um, get connected to our newsletters because that's where both Akila and I write authentically and say, hey, this is what I felt during the week. And you can get to learn a few more tools on how to deal with different situations that may come up for you. It may resonate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're, we use all mediums. So sometimes it's a written message. Sometimes it's video. Sometimes it's audio. Sometimes it might just be an image. So um, we invite you to come through. We'd love to learn more about how we can support you in your process to really accepting your full self and expressing that self wherever you want. All right. So we send you so much love and light. Thank you for watching. Comment absolutely. below and let us know how you're feeling. All right. Peace and love.